people say, well, the Jews crucified him. No, the religious people who were the least spiritual, the religious leaders who were the most corrupt, the religious leaders that convinced or pushed this on, Pilate wasn't even interested, couldn't have been bothered. So it was the religious people. And if we are parsing this book, you're going to see more interaction with the average folk, some Samaritans, mostly Jews, a couple of strangers here or there. And overall, not all, not everybody rejected him. You say, well, but he went to the cross alone and basically died alone. Yes, but we're talking about who could see him and respond. <laughs> John 1.11 says he came to his own, and his own received him not. And I want you to think of how staggering that is. The reason why I say it's staggering is because his own means the people that should have received him. We're talking about the Jewish people. So you, when you read that, you think his own, his own country, his own people. But think about that and let that sink in a little bit. And the great mystery in this, you know, this is a question that I myself have difficulty actually crystallizing the answer for. If for every mother in Israel to believe that she would give birth to the Messiah, the anticipation of a coming deliverer, which was promised through the Old Testament, they don't call it that because it wasn't the Old Testament at that time, right? But the question is, how exactly did they understand or define Messiah? You see, if you look at the life of Christ, and let's just say we're reading John's book, John, of course, starts with something that tells you John understands Jesus was from before his birth in eternity. He was there at the beginning and starts from there. What is kind of mind-boggling is that that would not be a traditional Jewish view of anything. When I say, how would they have understood the Messiah? They could not be thinking anything other than possibly a deliverer type like Moses, who would be moved by the voice of God, not God himself. That's one. Two, did they envision that he would be an automatic king, such as the kings that ruled Israel of old? See, we don't ask these questions. How did they understand how Messiah would be? And for that, you almost have to go to the rabbinic literature much later to find out how they understood who or how Messiah would be. But here's the one thing we know. See, I, I love when we can look at the whole book, and the whole book brings everything to light. You read John 1.11, he came to his own and his own received him not. Verse 12, but as many as received him, to, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And he goes on to say, which were born not of blood, nor the will of flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. Now, here's what's mind-boggling. This is a New Testament statement, which has been kind of borrowed from something in the old. Psalm 118 the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone or the headstone. So right there, I, see, this is what I love about the Bible, and I'm sorry I can't contain my enthusiasm at times because it, it excites me to see when you can see God saying the same thing. We're talking about uh, millennia apart, possibly, and different people, but God saying the same thing. So, and then this statement I just quoted out of uh, Psalm 118 is then reiterated again in Acts 4. And I find this really interesting. So the stone that, which was set at naught, uh, Acts 4.11 reads, the stone which was set at naught of you, build, you builders. You go there and you read about who he's talking about when he says you builders, and it all fits nicely together. Now we have to be careful about how we read and interpret because it's very clear that the Jewish people living in Jesus' day, especially at the time he was born, like I said, there was great 
expectancy for Messiah. But we cannot say that people understood exactly what that meant. And by that I mean, if they were waiting for a millennia, and then suddenly this man comes on the scene, and his speech is different, he performs miracles, he speaks as one who has inside information. He's not, he's not somebody like me, I'm repeating the words. He was speaking as the word. No one had ever seen that before, so it's baffling to me that they rejected him. Now, let's not make this too much of a blanket statement, and I have, this is where I, I need to elaborate a little bit. We often take that, he came to his own, and his own received him not, and we say, well, they rejected him. Or I'll hear people say things like, well, the Jews crucified Christ. No, I'm sorry, you need to, you need to be very careful about how you approach this. It was the religious people and those religious people of Christ's day, the Sanhedrin, for example, the Sadducees, the Pharisees, these some groups within the body that was the community. And I think each had their own uh, way of understanding. Now, what, what we have in the Sanhedrin and in these ruling bodies, you're going to have people that will come out of there and they will start to follow Christ, but we, we have to deduce certain things. For example, Nicodemus. It says he was a ruler amongst the Jews or of the Jews. He comes to Jesus by night. I'll, I'll come back to him because that, that needs elaboration. You've got somebody like Joseph of Arimathea who will be a secret follower. So we cannot say he came to his own and his own received him not as a blanket statement. They all rejected him. No, even Jesus' disciples... They, there was no Christianity yet. They were Jews. So the essence of what's being said in John 1.11 is not they all rejected him. Otherwise, there'd be no disciples. There'd be no spreading of the gospel, right? So we have to be careful about that. And the other thing when people say, well, the Jews crucified him. No, the religious people who were the least spiritual, the religious leaders who were the most corrupt, the religious leaders that convinced or pushed this on, Pilate wasn't even interested, couldn't have been bothered. So it was the religious people. And if we are parsing this book, you're going to see more interaction with the average folk, some Samaritans, mostly Jews, a couple of strangers here or there. And overall, not all, not everybody rejected him. You say, well, but he went to the cross alone and basically died alone. Yes, but we're talking about who could see him and respond. Look at Peter, thou art the Christ. Of course, even when Nicodemus came to Jesus by night, he said, we know that thou art a rabbi sent of God. So there was no question on some of these religious people's minds that this man was the real deal, but they could not say it. In fact, the final part of this message, I'll, I'll talk about Paul, but even Paul, that's one of those where you, you just have to stop for a minute and look at this to the person who asked the question, how do you prove God's existence? Well, that may not be the right question for Paul, but here's a man who we know was persecuted, a zealous Jew persecuting Christians on his way to bind them and take him off to Jerusalem probably to kill him. Who knows? How do you take a person who is so devout, so, so much zeal in the wrong way, and turn them completely upside down so now, now they are preaching the message they preached against? Right? So, but again, Paul was of a certain class of people. That's why I said we have to be careful about the terminology we use Many, many people in ministry, preachers, priests, have made the mistake of pour, putting the whole brunt, if you will, of Christ being crucified on the Jewish people. But I'm going to say it like this because I think it makes more sense. He said, for this I came. So I think it's almost like God said, look, I've, I've put all the puzzle pieces in, in order here. 
but there's still going to have to be a final sacrifice. So think about it. Everything that happened happened kind of the way God laid it out. Otherwise, I asked the question last week, what would have happened if he came to his own and his own received him? I'm talking about mass reception. Where would we be? Don't answer that. That's complicated. All right. So I like to ask these questions even though I may not probe them too deeply because that's where you start to ask more questions and darn it, I did it again, right? Okay, so um, what was mind-boggling to these people and what contributed to them rejecting him? And that's what we're looking at. Um, so let's start off with this. It was too mind-blowing to say two distinct natures lived in a person. All God, all man. Two mind, there had never been anything like this ever to be seen by these people. So how do you explain to people? Of course, that brings about people wanting to say, it's a lie, it's a fraud, because they've never seen it before. They've never been exposed to this before. So rabbinic literature says that Christ, or sorry, the Messiah, would be an ordinary human, but not just any ordinary human. If there's a lot of um, strange verbiage where they make a statement and then they don't elaborate on it. So if you really want to get frustrated, read rabbinic literature. It's very healthy to, uh, right? Okay, be angry and sin not. All right. They said he would be royalty, but not just another king. These are true statements. So when they came to processing this, it was almost like, well, he checks all the boxes. If you think about it, they call him son of David, which shows his lineage to David. In other places, they, remember in some of the scriptures, they wanted to make him king. So there's, there's enough information. He's from the house of Judah. All of the prophecies that foretold of him and this is why I say to you, you can't just read one or the other. Why? Because just as I told you that the, the records that kind of show all the family trees in the Bible, we call them the genealogical records, were very important to the Jewish people. This is why Matthew opens his book with a genealogy. This kind of shows you, this is a Jewish thought process, but Matthew's purpose for doing that is to show the lineage and the descent. Luke picks up the same thing, because remember Luke said he was going to put everything, all things in order, does the same thing. He does a different type of genealogy. But the idea here is to show that if we were looking to try and see, does, does Christ check this box? Does he check this box? To fulfill what would be required in Scripture for him to even be considered Messiah. And he checks those boxes. So... This is the question. There was no New Testament yet, right? There's no New Testament. All we know is Jesus of Nazareth, the man of Galilee, the carpenter's son, the crazy story that he's born of a virgin, right? But we don't have, the New Testament hasn't been written yet, so all you have to confirm is the old, which, again, I say they didn't call it that then. Anybody with a brain would have said, well, wait, this man comes from the house of Judah. He's of the line of David. They should have been checking. So here's what becomes the big problem. Not the average person, the religious people. And when you get this part of the lesson, it all becomes clear. The religious people who studied the book, they had to have had some inclination, some knowledge, but you'll read every time they sought to trip him up. They sought to, everything was almost like a gotcha moment. You ever notice that? You're reading and gotcha. They want to gotcha him all the time. Well, this tells you something about them, okay? A religious leader steeped in this book that would have knowledge of all of these scriptural references. We're talking strictly Old Testament again would have looked at Jesus and, yeah, you would scrutinize it, but uh, you would have taken a different approach, which tells me that the spiritual and religious leadership of Jesus' day is a byproduct of what I've been preaching about, that 
you can see, in, for example, in the book of Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, it was the priests that were offering the maimed sacrifices. So we have this degeneration of leadership, which now probably doesn't even immerse itself into the book and into studying. So they don't even know, or maybe they decided, we're just whole cloth, this, this guy's a clown, or he's a liar, or he's whatever, he's an imposter, we reject him. But my thinking is, not everybody had that way of approach towards Christ. So I think probably what we need to look at is how, how he starts his ministry, okay? You read enough in this book that his early ministry, he was well-received. Well, what do you mean by that? Well, didn't he feed 5,000? Didn't he feed 4,000? Doesn't it say in multiple places that the multitudes came to see the man from Galilee? So what happened? You know, if you start off good and you've got all this big following, that's a mega church right there, right? <laughs> but we learn that these were false followers. We learn that people had other reasons and agendas for following Christ. For some, they followed Christ to be healed because, listen, we live in a day of modern medicine. You have an ailment, you go to the doctor, the doctor says take these pills and get more sick, all right? Uh, but back in that day, what do you got? You got a couple of herbs maybe, some herbs, some herbal remedies, and that for really dire diseases, you would need a miracle. So they came for healing, and if they got healed, many of them probably got healed and then went on their way, never coming back, and that was that. Other people followed for food, free food. Who doesn't want free food? <laughs> but you notice something, it didn't last. They came out for the food, all right. They missed the meaning of the miracle. They missed the meaning of what he did, that he could provide for them something more in their soul where they would never hunger ever again. But the whole meaning was missed, and he elaborates on that. We'll visit that passage as well. So there's enough to look at. They wanted healing. They wanted food. They wanted signs and wonders. The problem with that is people who look for signs and wonders, there'll never be enough proof. They'll never see enough miracles. Look at the children of Israel. God put on display the great, better than any Vegas show you could go see. Can you imagine the Nile turning red? Or frogs everywhere. As you turn around, that's all you can see. Or whatever, whatever bugs fell from the sky, all right? And yet they wouldn't. See, if I was exposed to that, one time I'd say, maybe one time, I'm a little hardhead, right? One, one miracle I might say, mm, I don't know about that. But if I'm seeing the second one and the third one, I'm, I'm thinking, I better shut my mouth and go in the right direction and keep my head down lest I get hit by lightning, right? Would be enough. But not for these people and not in Jesus' day. They came to him saying, give us a sign, give us a sign. Do you remember what he said to them? He said, there'll be no sign except the sign of Jonah. And he was speaking of his resurrection. They couldn't even understand that. And even in today's society of people that say, well, why do you use that? Because Jonah is the least credible book in the Bible. Are you crazy? If the Lord spoke it out of his mouth and he's referencing the sign of Jonah, me thinks that Jonah actually was in a big fish. Well, that's impossible. Well, with God, all things are possible. So go talk to God about it. Don't waste my time with, it's impossible. All right. So they wanted signs and wonders. So three main things, food, healing, signs and wonders. All right. His teaching was incredibly unique. If you stop to think about it, this too is mind-boggling. What would you do if you went to synagogue or you heard the corner rabbi and the rabbi spoke and said, thou shalt not, blah, blah, whatever it is, okay? And there's a whole bunch of thou shalt and thou shalt not. And here comes this revolutionary Jesus saying, you've heard it said unto you, thou shalt not commit adultery or thou shalt not hate, but behold, thou shalt not murder, but behold, I say to you, and he completely changes the narrative Raising the bar, but I don't think the people actually understood it either. I think a lot went right over their heads. And so you begin to see 
everything about this man is different and unique. And this, I think, is again why it's mind-boggling to me. How could they reject, with all of these things that I'm saying, kind of mind-boggling. Okay, so he talks about heaven, and he talks about hell, and he talks about the children of the kingdom. And he's not talking about any of this, like, and verse 22 says, blah, 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 in my father's house there are many mansions. So he's saying, hey, I'm going to tell you what the mansion looks like. I'm going to tell you how many rooms there are, what type of linens there. I'm talking, being ridiculous, but you get my point. He was talking to the people as if he knew. So, again, very different. Most of Jesus' initial disciples, as I've already said, were Jewish, such as, let's take Matthew, for example, and Peter, for example. Now, we say they didn't reject him, but let's be careful about something, because even if you follow their stories as they've written them out, you can see there's a lot of uncertainty, and that speaks for the whole group. They first say, oh, let's go follow him, right? Nathaniel and Philip and Andrew, let's go follow him. But then you quickly find out there's a lot of parts to this that you can see doubt, which is human nature. There's no sin in that. But you can also see at times confusion, right down to the last moment where Peter, who Jesus foretold, you're going to deny me three times, came to pass. I, didn't, I don't know how you could look at any of this and say it's a blanket whole cloth, one people that rejected him. Because I'm looking at so many different people. So I go back to this. Just I want to be clear. The religious people, we're talking about those that are corrupt. They don't really care about God. They care about their own gain. Those are the people that are going to press for his crucifixion. Let's go kill him. Let's go take him. Let's seize him. All right? Now, we were talking about the Pharisees. And the Pharisees are a mixed group who controlled most of the synagogues. On the other hand, the Sadducees controlled most of the temple and many of the common people would have to be interfacing with one or the other. You don't get around it. So let's break this down a little bit more. The, you have diverse individual groups or whole groups, if you will, that rejected him. The timeline of his rejection and what, if any, of the details of that rejection, which I'm going to clarify because that probably doesn't make sense as I say it, but I'll show you what I mean in a minute. So as I said, early in Jesus' ministry, we have the crowd. So just for the sake of those that are new listeners or they don't know what I'm talking about, let me read a verse to you so you could say I read it just for the, to satisfy those that maybe don't know. Uh, in Matthew, for example, it says, Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease among the people. His fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought unto him all sick people that were taken with diverse diseases and torments, and those which were possessed with devils, and those which were lunatic. He missed one. And those that had the palsy. <laughs> I didn't point at any of you. <laughs> And he healed them. And there followed him great multitudes of people from Galilee and from Decapolis and from Jerusalem and Judea and from beyond Jordan. So at the get-go, Jesus' ministry looks like a major success. So here's a man who presents the gospel. He has the power to heal people. The words he speaks should bring and fill the person with light. And the message, how many times did Jesus speak of heaven and the kingdom? Enough to say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to listen to what he has to say. But remember, a lot of these people already had the background of what we're calling the Old Testament, at least to some degree. They at least knew the Pentateuch. So there's at least the concepts there. You cannot tell me that Jesus' ministry was a success because he had the multitudes. In fact, it proves the point. The success was at the very end. Who was with him at the very end? I'm talking about death and resurrection, a very small group of people. That's the church of Jesus Christ. And I'm not saying the church should be small, 
But I'm saying if you quest for numbers, some of you heard, and I've said this before, the ministries that say, oh, we, we, we've saved, like McDonald's, we've saved uh, you know, so many millions of people. I'm sorry, how the hell do you know that? There's no way you could possibly, just because somebody says, I'm a sinner, and I know I'm a sinner, and I need the Lord Jesus, that does not mean salvation. That means that they listen to you and repeat it after you, period. The only way to know that is between that person and God when their life, the progress of Christianity, the minute you start following Christ, it's like somebody has dumped buckets of stuff on you, and I'm talking about Skabala, okay? Just everywhere you go, it's like the world is, is collapsing. You turn your life over to Christ, if you want to put it that way, and don't think it's going to be great. It's going to get tough. All the messages over the years of people saying, you know, I, I've been watching you for so long. I really understand you now. I understand what I'm doing. I love the Lord. I want a King's House number and a King's Tithers number, and then I'll get a message two weeks later. I just lost my job, and I'm being evicted from my house. You want to have trouble? Become a Christian. I'm not saying that to be funny. I'm saying that to be true. Does it last? No, it doesn't last. But I always say, if you are really honest, you're going to see this pattern with almost everyone to some degree, they come in like a goonie bird. Ah, oh, Jesus loves me. I'm great, right? And then all of a sudden when the stuff hits, you, you, you think, well, God's not doing anything for me. And that's why a lot of people fall away. This is the parable of the sower. That's why a lot of people cannot handle the attack of the devil. They don't believe in the devil. Even me saying that, I'd be like, oh, she believes in that? Oh, that's a shame. Because I was, I was actually liking her until she mentioned the devil. So my point is here, the crowds don't always symbolize success. So John 6, we have Jesus feeding the 5,000. I've already mentioned that to you. After these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias. A great multitude followed him. Pretty great, 5,000, right? Where were the 5,000 after he fed them? Where'd they go? I don't know, but they certain, certainly were not following him, right? And we have a record that just keeps going of this same pattern. The probing question we might want to ask is, for example, you read over and over, it says, many believed in his name, but how did they even understand what that meant? See, did, did, did they walk around saying, Jesus, Yeshua, God saves, or the salvation of God, did they understand what, what they were crying out? Or was it just, I'm just part of this group, and there's no way to really know that. But remember what is written in John 2, that Jesus did not commit himself to them because he knew what was inside. That, in, if you could just stop right there and just kind of give that about 30 seconds of thought, he did not commit to them himself to them because he knew what was on the inside. That's actually kind of frightening. That should make all of us think, not, you know, oh, I, I'm, I'm the greatest person here. No, that should make you think, I am a lucky son of a gun. Because Jesus is still doing the same thing. He's still looking inside the heart. So just, you know, I think a lot of things could be taken for granted here, and I, I, I don't. I think, wow, each one of these is... Just enough for me to say I'm so totally blessed. All right, then we read about, I mentioned Nicodemus, a Pharisee who came to Jesus by night. That's John 3. It says there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And he says, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him, not in him, with him, right? There's all these subtle nuances here you gotta, you got to think about. So it's kind of radical that a Pharisee is visiting Jesus. And I've always read this passage a certain way, but I had to read it a different way, which was Nicodemus had problems with the answers that Jesus gave him. He says, you must be born again. And the Greek makes it clear, you must be born from above. How can a man be born again when he's old? How can a mother go, 
How can a, how can a person go back into the tunnel, right? Okay, never mind. <laughs> he, couldn't, he couldn't get it. He didn't understand, okay? So what's important here is to recognize, although we don't have anything here that says, and Nicodemus then was a follower of Christ, or he became devoted to, we don't have that here. But I'd bet you any amount of money, just based on this conversation alone, that this was a life-changing transition for Nicodemus. And I think deliberately God might be silent on what happens to Nicodemus, but I'm going to go on to say that this man had to have had the, the kind of mind-blowing scenario, and specifically after Christ died and rose again, I think, although nowhere it is written, I believe Nicodemus had to be a fierce uh, proclaimer of Christ. So it's not written there, but when I say Pharisees, you just read, he is a man of the Pharisees, and yet here he is. So not every religious leader would have been corrupt or bad, but the vast majority of them were. So that's enough to say. Now the Pharisees, if you remember, they also rebuked Jesus for the company he kept. <laughs> this man sits and eats with sinners. Like, I, if I was there, I'd have been like, yeah, so? <laughs> Big deal, right? Because we all understand we're all sinners. But they didn't, remember, they didn't view themselves like that. So even their speech gives them away. This man, how could he like, make himself unclean? He's, he's eating with sinners. They did not have that understanding. So, for example, when Jesus healed the man on the Sabbath, and he told the man to take up his bed and walk, these same people were outraged. Not that he healed the man. Well, yeah, he healed him on the Sabbath. That's one thing. But they were outraged because Jesus says, take up your bed and walk. Oh, this man just broke the Sabbath. And he's creating, you know, he's instigating here, right? Well, of course, they don't know, but he's also Lord of the Sabbath. And we find that elsewhere being repeated. So in, in, in John's writing, it's actually much more of an issue um, because repeatedly we have different scenarios where he heals on the Sabbath, and this is just an outrage. Now think of it. The person is suffering. They might be completely, their body's in complete pain, and they've been in pain for a long time, some 12 years, some 38 years. Oh, no, you can't heal this man on the Sabbath. That's a crime. Now, yeah, it's better to leave the guy sick. You know, oh, I'll be back Monday when I can walk another 500 miles back to come and heal the man. No problem, right? So I think if you read things within their context, you see even the speech of those people shows you that there was already the undergirdings of, we'll call it heat, but it's cloaked as something like, we better, we better find out more about this man because he could be a threat to our future. And that is the undergirding of everything you hear out of their mouths. John 5, 16 is one of those verses. Uh, and therefore did the Jews persecute Jesus, sought to slay him because he had done these things on the Sabbath repeatedly. Unfortunately, as I said, the same thing with him feeding the multitudes, there's always something at the end where people are, they either go away, and that's the rejection part there, or they're angry at what he did. There's, there are different ways to look at how to reject God's word and God's ways and God's acts, and they're all basically, you can see them for yourselves when you start reading through, a careful read, by the way, uh, through the Gospels, and you start seeing they're, they're there, you've always seen the, but put some flesh and blood on this when you recognize these religious people were kind of, think of the religious people of Jesus' day like a government. And that'll make sense. They do all the corruption, they do all the stuff, but they're telling you, you better be moral, you better be law-abiding. You better. <laughs> okay, all right. Turn with me to Matthew 12, please. So Matthew 12, beginning at verse 22. This is another form. You might not see it as rejection at the first, but I'm going to show you. These are all diverse ways and groups, and, but there's things in here that you just got to look for and pay special attention to. So Matthew 12, beginning at verse 22. 
Then was brought unto him one possessed with a devil, blind and dumb, and he healed him so much, insomuch that the blind and dumb both spake and saw. And all the people were amazed and said, Is not this the son of David? So there's this interesting question right there. And why I say it's interesting is because son of David was a very specific term. So I want you to think the people are watching this and they're saying, tantamount to almost voicing or articulating that he is who we know he is. But using the term son of David, everyone in the room or wherever they were would have understood what that implication meant. But when the Pharisees heard it, they said, this fellow doth not cast out devils, but by Beelzebub, the prince of the devil. So no, he's not of God, he's of the devil and does it by the power of the devil. So that's another way you might say, well, this is a criticism or a condemnation. This is another way to reject Jesus, but not just reject Jesus, reject his power and his authority over sickness, disease, and evil spirits. Okay? Jesus knew their thoughts and said unto them, every kingdom divided against itself is brought to desolation, and every city or house divided against itself shall not stand. And if Satan cast out Satan... He is divided against himself. How shall then his kingdom stand? But, and if I, by Beelzebub, cast out devils, by whom do your children cast them out? Therefore they shall be your judges. But if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is come unto you. <gasps> Impossible, right? Or else how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods except he first bind the strong man? And then he will spoil his house. He that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. These are very necessary to understand because of what has just happened. It says, now this is probably the key to all this. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit shall not be forgiven unto men. Whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. So you have to understand why Jesus is saying this. He's not taking this as personal because he says, whoever speaks the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But whoever speaketh against the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. That's a big mouthful right there because what he was saying is these spiritual, pseudo-spiritual people had no spiritual discernment. When he said these words... How, how, um, but if I cast out devils by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God is coming to you. That could not even be received by them. So to discount him and to discount by the powers, but by what powers? Remember, the people are saying, son, isn't this not the son of David? That's just shy of saying something messianic towards him. They have to come in and say, no, no, no. Just the opposite, my friends. He's doing it by the power of the devil. So the rejection here is a little bit more intense. And this is a cautionary note to people who are listening to me right now. You notice what he said. He said, basically, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men. He even goes so far as to say, and whosoever speaketh the word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him. But one thing that's not forgivable not pardonable in this life or in the next, is blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. So think long and hard about what he's saying here because he's essentially, it's a death sentence to the religious leaders he's talking to. They probably won't be forgiven either, is the essence of this. But what is important in looking at all this is that there was always some undermining attempt to reject, to push back. So here he says, but if this... If I do these things by the Spirit of God, oh, no, 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 this is by the Spirit of the devil, right? And so I think we have all these examples. At your own leisure, find them in the Gospels, and you'll see what I'm saying. There are nuances. They had to nitpick or dig to find things that they would completely, oh, no, he can't be Messiah for this reason. We reject it for this reason, for this reason. It, it, keep, keep adding up the reasons. And he dispels each and every one of them, by the way, if you were even interested. Now, forgive me for making you do this, but I need you to go back to John and turn to chapter 11. 
So in John 11, we'll start at 53, but I was looking at 54. Then from that day forth, they took counsel together for to put him to death. That is, those are the religious leaders. Therefore, Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews, but went thence in, unto a country near to the wilderness into a city called Ephraim, and there continued with his disciples. Now, don't you think it's interesting? Jesus therefore walked no more openly among the Jews. He doesn't say, John doesn't say, among his people. So if you read, you're going to find places where the writers writing the gospel will say something like, it was the feast of the Jews, but it doesn't say our feast. There, there, even there is an imperceptible very beginning of seeing something different on the horizon. Okay, So that's something you can do in your own leisure. And when you find those references, just take note of who's saying them. But I find it interesting. Um, he has to go into the wilderness of a city called Ephraim away from these people. So in, in one respect, when I think of all the different places we find Jesus, for example, he's talking to you. Remember when he was talking to the woman at the well, that Samaritan woman? He's encountering people all over the place. And this is what is so amazing. Look at the people who respond to him, okay? I'm not telling you that the only people that can respond to Christ are the outcasts, the, the, the dregs of society, but look at the people that respond to him. One of my... Uh, often repeated, you've got different personalities, but they all kind of are on the lower side of society. They all are kind of messed up, right? But yet somehow Jesus sits with them, he talks with them, he eats with them, he converses with them. So this woman at the well that comes out, she's a Samaritan. Now add, add to that, bad, not bad enough, she's a woman, she's also a Samaritan, right? And the Jews and Samaritans have no dealings, it says in John 4, with each other. And she says to him, essentially, why are you talking to me? Jews don't have an association with Samaritans. And he just keeps talking to her and tells her everything about her, right? Including the fact that she's been married to many men, including the man that she's with now is not her husband, right? She runs off and she tells everybody, that this, this is the exact opposite of rejection. She hears the message, at first is reluctant, hears it, receives it, goes into the village, tells the people, this man has told me everything I've ever done, and some people believe because of her testimony. We have the complete opposite. So the upper echelon of society, those that were the super spiritual, all knowledgeable, all important people, they didn't need Jesus. Well, few, but they didn't need Jesus. You see, the lower people of society, the average man, the common man, they could hear the message. If they were able to receive, they could hear it. So I think all of these things have to be put into the equation when we consider why the rejection of Christ by the Jews. Once Jesus was arrested and standing before the high priest being questioned, they asked him about his doctrine, to which he replied, I speak openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogues and in the temple, whether the Jews always resort, and in secret I have said nothing. Why askest thou me, askest those who heard me what I said? Behold, they know what I've said. In other words, you're going to condemn me or you're going to say something? Well, I've never said anything publicly that I haven't, I haven't said anything privately that I haven't said publicly. I'm not speaking against you. And if you're interested in what I've said, go and ask these people over here. So... It seems to me there was enough there for the religious leaders to turn around and actually do some interviewing. What, what is this man saying? Is he speaking against God? Or is he, was he speaking to pr promote the kingdom? Is he speaking about good things? Is he teaching you? None of that was even a part of an inquiry. It was just already determined he must be speaking blasphemies, right? So once he's put on the cross, we have another round. And this one is more mockery the signage that Pilate uh, puts above Christ, if you remember, in three languages, uh, King of the Jews. Now, what's funny is the irony of the high priest coming out and asking Pilate, I want you to think about this. This is the delicious part. Pilate, 
why did you put on the sign, King of the Jews? Say, better for you to make a sign that says, he said he was King of the Jews. They didn't like that at all. That, there was more impetus there. Do you understand the difference? Pilate said on his sign, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. No, don't, don't say that. Say he said that he was King of the Jews. That is how repulsed they were. That was the mission now. And if you follow in the Gospels, you see even how they make up the money story that the guards guarding the tombs were paid off and they actually took the body. So there was already this whole cloth rejection. Listen, if what Christ was saying was true, and it was, but if, if they acknowledged it as true, their lives as they knew it, their probably tapping the till, robbing the people was over, right? So we can't have that. Again, this reminds me of our government. You can't have that, right? You got to keep the corruption going. I mean, corruption is the fun part of life. I got to keep it going, right? So I think what I'm trying to tell you is when you look at all these things, it's pretty spectacular to see the rejection, not the acceptance, the rejection. If these people knew the scriptures, I need to pause right here to tell you something. So you can see there's always applications to what's going on right now. And let me show you. In the news cycle yesterday, a story came out of Italy, of all places, out of the Catholic Church. And the story is that a priest decided to replace Joseph in the nativity scene with another Mary, another woman. Because, in his words, more or less, not verbatim, the church has done so much harm to people of alternative lifestyles that we need to show, this, this shows that there can be two mothers. Did you just hear what I just said? Now listen, I don't condemn people. You, you make your own decisions in life. My job, I'm sorry, I'm not the pastor who's going to come and inspect what you do in your bedroom. I don't want to know. Please, I really don't want to know. But here's the thing. This is this, what I just shared with you, is a rejection of Christ. And, and how so? It's a rejection of God's word. And how so? Because this church, the Roman Catholic Church, feels the need to bend everything out of shape so that everybody can feel included. Well, I've said this, and I'll say it again. For the love of God, this is why Jesus said, whosoever will, come unto me. He didn't say, you must be straight, you must be not either not divorced. He never made any preference or any exclusion. He said, whosoever will, come unto me, I'll give you rest. I don't know where these people get off changing the narrative, changing the scriptures. Now, again, it's pretty, it's pretty rich considering these are people putting up nativity scenes. I'm not, listen, to each his own, but it's almost like you already are living in a, you're a priest. You're living in fantasy land because you're not studying this book. You, you prefer to go with the dogmas that have been accepted. And now you're going to turn this into, well, we must hang the rainbow flag, we must accommodate, because the church somehow, yes, listen, I'm not going to lie to you, I think the church has done terrible damage, not just to the gay people or to these people, that people, but the damage is this. You make your lifestyle choices. Whether you're gay or straight, you make those choices. That's your business. You are to work those things out with God. Listen, a man and a woman get married and they have marital troubles. You work it out with God. And if your alignment with things is not as God put it, you work that out with God too. Talk to God about it. But when you start making it so the church needs to bend itself out of shape and change itself, we need to somehow uh, project the rainbow onto the church. Let's get a projector and, and project it onto the church so that people can see, I can virtue signal to you that we're all accepting. Well, I'm sorry, but the church of Jesus Christ was designed from its inception to be all in inclusive. Paul said, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, 
male or female, bond or free, but all are one in Christ. So you tell me where you get off having the, sorry to say it, gonads to change what God said, when in fact that is a rejection of what God established. And you tell me that you want to be part of something that is aiding in the, the moral destruction of our world. The Pope came out last week and said, well, we're going to bless same-sex marriages, and we're but there's conditions and strings. I'm sorry. Hear me out very clearly. People don't necessarily, two people can fall in love, they, things happen. I'm not the person to condemn. I'm not the person to judge. The Bible says what it says. Read the Bible and find out what God thinks of that. I can tell you, though, why do we have to, why do we have to dress the church up in a scarlet robe and present her as the Babylon whore instead of keeping the church as pure to Christ as possible. That's not really possible because we're human and we're sinners, but keeping it as close to what Christ desired to build his church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. No, we have to open the gates of hell and let the hell-bound people in because that's what we're supposed to, and we're supposed to also put those people on a pedestal. So tell me why you get a prize for showing up with your gender issues, but a straight person doesn't get a prize for showing up, and they've got other issues too. I'm sorry, the, the day of sorting people out by your sexual preference, by your skin color, or by anything else, for me, over. Only one thing is a criteria to come into the church of Jesus Christ. You see the red blood of Jesus Christ. You know that it saves you. It washes you from all your sins. And you put a period there and you don't add to any of this because God said this is the reason he came. He did not come to accommodate our warped, perverted society. Now, the reason why America is in this state and the world is in this state. Reject the word of God. Reject it, and what you have left is what you see. The morals that are so decrepit and decayed, the ideologies, no, that's why people don't have any trouble wanting to change our Constitution. Think of it. What did I just say that's any different? Like God's word is God's word, and don't change what it says. Don't try and modify it to say, well, really, Jesus was a queer. You know how many times I've been hearing this, people saying, well, no, Jesus actually preferred men because he had only disciples around him. Really? Okay, listen. Um, I'm sorry that you have a sick and perverted mind. I'm sorry that you don't understand, but this behavior is a rejection. So the church is painting itself as, we're accepting of you, but what they're doing, hear me, Revelation, Christ knocking at the door, that's what we're talking about. He's not knocking at the door, shivering in the cold, like, oh, will you let me in? They have pushed him out of the church. He's no longer in the church. It's no longer his church. It's a church of something else, but it's not his church anymore. That's why he's outside in, in Revelation knocking. Until we figure that out, the rejection of Christ still goes on. Now, I'm not done. I was going to say, well, we can wrap up here, but I'm not done. I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, the short version of what I need to do to wrap up here. I look at the Apostle Paul. In almost, I think, the last five, six, seven years in my presentation of the resurrection, I've said, he's my star witness to prove the resurrection. See, here's a man who got all the pedigree behind him, steeped, I want to talk about steeped in this book, Pharisee of Pharisee, tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew, circumcised on the eighth day. Here's a man on a mission, a zealous Jew, to take out Christians. We only have a few verses that tell us that he sought to round them up, bind them, and take them off to Jerusalem or wherever he was going to take them to. That's all we have. But don't think that his life of attacking Christians happened in two verses like it happened in a day. That had to be going on for some time. We, 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 we don't necessarily mind the depths of that, but just think about it. If you, if you were doing this, what he was doing, attacking Christians on a regular basis, and then all of a sudden he has this encounter with Christ, and Christ says to him very clearly on the Damascus Road, that's Acts 9, he says to him, 
Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Why are you doing this to me? He didn't say, why are you doing this to the people? Because he was already in the people. Why are you doing this to me? And you take a man who is an important Pharisee in the community. He's an important man with standing. He's got people that have to respect him in his community, and he has this encounter that changes him radically. He's blinded for a time, and when he's regained his sight, what's the first thing he does? He goes out and he starts preaching about the good news in Jesus Christ. You tell me that God's not capable of taking rejection that's rejection at its finest hour and turning it on its head. See, with God, all things are possible. And this is why I'm telling you, when we talk about the Jewish people and their rejection of Christ, there's going to be a rude awakening. See, there is too much scripture that explains what will happen. In fact, passages out of Isaiah, I believe it's Isaiah 60, that talk about the people will come first through the city and how the city was desolate, and nobody wanted to go through it. People will come into it, and then they will worship at his feet. That is speaking of a future time. That is speaking of Jew and Gentile. That's speaking of all the peoples of the earth who are still alive, if they have not been massacred in the great and final battle on earth, or smitten by the plagues. So think about that. It's as if God is saying, yes, they rejected me, but I also foretold that they would, that they would hear. In fact, it was Isaiah that said it, and Christ repeated it. They would, they would hear, but they would not hear. They would see, but they would not be able to see. Essentially, nothing will penetrate. And to this day, nothing will penetrate. Try and talk to someone. Now, I have a lot of different, at different levels, Jewish friends. Some of them are incredibly open, and in fact, I think lean towards... Uh, more like Jews for Jesus, Messianic Jews. But there are a whole host of people that you cannot talk to them about Christ. They don't want to know about it. It's actually like you just said the worst thing in the world to them. It makes them coil back. That won't last. That's not forever. So when somebody says, well, what about their behavior? What about how they've reacted? God foretold it. In fact, if you want to know something that should make you smile, it's God's word of prophecy that said this is how they will receive. They won't. And until, as I said last week, until this time is fulfilled, and then he will turn towards them. The people that God desires to have, whether you are Jew or Gentile, he will have. And the ones that rejected, don't say they'll all be punished because some, like Paul, will be turned on your head where you, one day you were preaching and speaking the truth of the Pentateuch, and the next day you see the prophet that was foretold in the Pentateuch, you realize that's Christ, right? So... I don't think we should be too harsh, too quick, too ready to jump on people and understand that, as I said last week, God has a plan. Even when they rejected his only begotten son, God has a plan. I hope you'll be here next week because next week I do want to get into Romans. That really is the meat and potatoes coming from the mouth of one who knows both sides of the equation, who might sort it all out, and maybe we'll put an exclamation mark there as the end, but who knows? For right now, this is my message. You've been watching me, Pastor Melissa Scott, live from Glendale, California at Faith Center. If you would like to attend the service with us Sunday morning at 11 a.m., simply call 1-800-338-3030 to receive your pass. If you'd like more teaching and you'd like to go straight to our website, the address is www.pastormelissascott.com.